Hey guys, welcome back. A lot of statistics students have difficulty distinguishing confidence intervals from hypothesis tests. They kind of seem to do the same thing. They kind of seem to do it in the same way. What is the difference? Well, in the next couple of minutes, I'll try to lay it out for you. I think the first thing to know is that these really are very related concepts. They are used, uh, roughly speaking, to do the same kinds of things. Um, it's not surprising that people confuse these two things. Um, they are both used to make inferences about the populations that you're studying. So they're, they're kind of ways for us to compare sample information with some claim about the population. Uh, they are also intervals. They give you a range of, of plausible estimates. Uh, the only real difference is what they're a range, but what are they constructed around? So one of these two is going to be a range constructed around sample information, and the other is going to be a range that's constructed around a population um, claim, population information. That really is the only difference. So here's a quick summary about confidence intervals. The idea is, in a confidence interval, you take a, a sample of a particular size, from that sample you construct or you calculate the sample average. And that's your best guess, like that's your point estimate for like what you think the population average is. Um, but you also want to like hedge your bets and give a little fudge factor, a little margin of error, a little plus or minus there. And the way that the pluses and minuses are constructed is the following way. We rely on the central limit theorem, which says that regardless of what your population looks like, when you draw samples, so this is your population of x's, when you draw samples, calculate averages from those samples, and look at the histogram of those all those possible sample averages that you might have taken, even if this guy isn't normal, this guy will be, according to the central limit theorem. It'll be centered around the true population mean. Now, if you're in your particular sample, you might be, you know, be all over the place. You might be here, you might be there. But on average, you'll be right. So the average of the distribution of x bars is centered right over mu. And what you'd like to do then is bracket off what you think plausible estimates are, some kind of plus or minus that would bracket mu. So you take your particular x bar that you calculated and you add and you subtract a little bit of something. Now, how much of that something depends on your level of confidence? And let's say we're going to do a 95 percent confidence interval. What that means is that whatever we bracket here should account for 95 percent of all the possible sample averages that we might have drawn from our parent population. So um, that means that half, uh, excuse me, um, do, 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 uh, we have 5 percent left over so 2.5 percent is on the right tail and 2.5% is on the, the left tail. And we can go to a normal table since this thing is going to be uh, normally distributed according to the central limit theorem. We go to a normal table and it'll tell us that really what we need to do is do 1.96 or minus 1.96 standard errors. In other words, standard deviations of this guy. Now those standard errors are going to be equal to the standard deviation of this guy, sigma, divided by the square root of n. But that part isn't important. What's important though is that when you're constructing a confidence interval, what you're doing is you're taking your particular point estimate and you're adding and subtracting a certain number of standard errors. So a confidence interval is really just a fudge factor that you put around your particular sample estimate. 
So let's just say that you 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 know were taking a, a sample of scores for you know your classmates' test scores, and you see that you're you know the the, the few friends that you asked uh, they had a sample average of of eighty percent, um, but some had above and some had below, and so the range there would be let's say seventy five and eighty five. Now this is your range estimate for what you think the class average on that test is. And if someone were to come up to you and say, you know what, I don't think so. I think that the class average on that midterm that you guys took was um, was a 70. Then you really would be skeptical of that claim. Because from your sample evidence, you're willing to go as low as 75 and as high as 85 but you're really not willing to go as low as 70%. And so you would reject a claim that the population average, in other words, the class average on that exam, was 70%. And so that's how you can use confidence intervals to, um, to test a claim about the population. Again, the idea is start off with your sample estimate and then add and subtract a certain number of standard errors. And that will give you a range of plausible estimates. That range is determined by your sample information, by the fact that your particular group of friends got 80% on average. Hypothesis tests are going to be a little similar. Let's see how, they're, let's see how they work. A hypothesis test kind of does the same thing, but rather than bracketing around your sample information, what it does is we take a claim about the population, oops, about the population, we presume that it's true, and if it is true, then, well, then only a certain, uh, only certain types of samples um, would, be, would be consistent with that. So if like I, I had a claim about a, a coin and I say, you know, this coin is, is a fair coin, um, heads and tails with, you know, 50-50 probability. So if I make that claim about, you know, this random variable, uh, then I really shouldn't expect that if I flip the coin 10 times, it comes up heads all 10 times. That would be a very low probability event under the assumption that this coin was fair. So what I'm going to do now with hypothesis tests is make a claim about the population average, let's say. So let's say that the average is some number mu. Um, in fact, let's, let's put a little zero there. Um, just to denote that this is really our null hypothesis, that this is our claim about the population. And we're going to presume that it's true. And if it's true, then we would expect, you know, a certain number of coin flips to come up heads and a certain number to come up tails. And all of this could happen from a fair coin. So we're going to take our 50-50 you know, coin flips and say, well, you know, it could be a little bit less and it could be more in a sample when we flip those coins. So ultimately what we'll have with our hypothesis test then is our hypothesized amount plus or minus, well now we need to know how much plus, how much minus. Right. In our last example we had 95 percent and so we know that if we're looking at uh, you know, how many standard deviations to the right and to the left will give us a 95% interval. We know that's 1.96. And now we need to have so many standard deviations or standard errors since we're talking about the distribution of averages. So we call them standard errors. So this is how we define the acceptance region in a hypothesis test. So let's write that down. This is our acceptance region.
And then in the tails, these would be our rejection regions. So the acceptance region looks just like a confidence interval for a hypothesis test. Not confidence interval. The hypothesis test is not constructed around X bar. It's constructed around this claimed population parameter. And the way you do the hypothesis test is after you've constructed this range of plausible values that are consistent with this hypothesis, then you go out and you collect a sample. And then you see whether that sample is a low probability event, given this conjecture, or if it's in the high probability area. If it's in the low probability area, then we start doubting this claim and maybe, you know, rejecting it ultimately. So we start out with a population claim and then we check to see whether the sample is consistent with the claim. So is the sample consistent with the claim? with our hypothesis. With confidence intervals, we want to know whether the claim is consistent with our sample information. So two just slightly different ways of really accomplishing the same kind of thing. So let's put it all together. With confidence intervals, we construct a plus or minus certain number of standard errors around the sample information. And then we see whether a claim is consistent with this. With hypothesis tests, we construct the same plus or minus interval, but we do it around a hypothesized claim. And then we check whether our sample is consistent with the claim. So in summary, it really is just kind of the same thing. It's just one construction interval around a sample mean and sees whether the the hypothesis fits in. The other one constructs um, an interval around a hypothesis, and then you check to see whether your sample kind of fits in. It's really the same idea. It's no surprise that students confuse the two, um, but if you can just keep in mind which one, you know, which what is the starting point for each of these analyses, then you can differentiate them. Now, ultimately, statisticians have opted for this approach for using hypothesis testing to actually test a hypothesis. And the reason is that confidence intervals really are um, symmetric intervals around um, a number. Hypothesis tests can actually construct intervals that are a little bit more broad. So we're not stuck to, strictly speaking, a plus or minus interval, but we can do um, less than intervals or greater than intervals. It allows us a little bit more flexibility. Uh, to see how that works, you'll have to check out a later video. Um, but for now, I think that's it. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.